This is conversation 16 of the Cooley account. We're going to drill down into the specific details of Pat Marcy's demise at the hands of Bob and Operation Gambat. It starts with a little bit of redundancy just to kind of reestablish the trajectory of getting Marcy into court and sneered in the legal system. Bob, let's talk about the demise of Pat Marcy, how you were able to ensnare him. You wore a wire on him. What did he say and, and how did that unfold? As I said uh, earlier, uh, I was not allowed to wear a wire on him. I was not allowed to go after anybody in the first ward. Uh, power structure. Uh, those were the those were the instructions by Belutus using, saying that it was too dangerous for me. What I did was I had to be very careful because I had always advised Pat and these other people, you know, never discuss anything with anybody. If you've done something in the past, some criminal activity, and somebody suddenly either calls you or meets with you and wants to talk about something you did, assume that you're talking into a wire and use that as an excuse to clean yourself up. And well, what do you mean? And I said, well, if I walk up to you and say, yeah, you remember that you know, that was interesting, that armed robbery we pulled, you know, back in whatever. I said, your response should be, what are you talking about? I would never commit an armed robbery. I would never do anything illegal. And as I said, as I told him in the past and others in the past, one of the reasons why they liked me was I was advising these people how to, how to avoid getting into trouble. So anyhow, what I did was I was at home. I was at home going through some old records, and I came across a letter uh, I had gotten in some documents indicating that there was a grand jury investigation back in New York on some of the only young guys that were, you know, were in, involved in that murder back in Chicago. You go shadow murder over there on, on Wentworth. My thought was, uh, I'm going to see if I can get Pat to say something about that. And that'll be my excuse. It'll be my excuse then, and hopefully they'll they'll give me the okay to go after him because he was he was my main target. He was the one that was in control of absolutely everything with the first ward. I I went to Counselor's Row, and and uh, there he was as usual at the uh, first ward table, and uh, I motioned for him that I wanted to talk to him, and we walked out into the uh, hallway below the 100 North uh, LaSalle building. And, uh, and I said, Pat, I said, somebody just sent me something, you know, from New York. You know, what's that? And I said, uh, they're going to send me something because uh, a couple of those kids that were involved in that shooting have been cooperating. And apparently they're telling uh, the grand jury that, you know, the case was fixed. When I get the documents, I'll show them to you. And he, oh, okay, sure. And uh, I wasn't wearing a wire at that time because I hadn't been allowed to wear a wire against him. I called Steve Bowen. I told Steve what I had done. I suspect it's a way to get Pat to admit he was involved in fixing the only own case before Judge Maloney. And uh, he made contact with, I'm pretty sure, it was with Tom Durkin, the first assistant that I was working with. And uh, I got the okay to wear a wire. Uh, it was a day or two later. I had the doc I had the documents and I went to meet him uh, at counselors and when I uh, when I showed him the documents as I said before I had my I had my hand over the uh, the date in it because the date you know the date was like three four years before that and uh, and I said to him I said the judge may have a problem we should you know we should warn you should warn the judge uh, that they're investigating this and he said to me the judge can take care of himself. That's not a problem. And then he said, then he said to me, "Isn't that the case where you had to go to New York to pick up the rest of the money?" And uh, as far as I was concerned, and as far as they were concerned, uh, that worked out great because that's him admitting he knew something about he <clears throat> something about the case. Isn't yeah. that incredible? After all those years where you weren't as engaged as you had been, that he let his guard down. It shows how much he trusted you. Oh, absolutely. I mean. These people had no reason not to trust me because, you know, I was, as far as they were concerned, I'm on top of the world. I had not been indicted, nor would I, nor did I figure I would have been. I had been running around with them, as I told you before, on those Thursdays, but almost every day there are counselors rose, and I'm sitting in there while they're discussing all kinds of illegal activities. They had no reason whatsoever to be worried about me or, or, or to question me. 
So after that, what we did then, we started building, we wanted to build a case against him. Uh, what we did was, he knew my friend John Began. You know, he knew him. He thought he was he thought he was totally nuts because John would come there with his stretch limo and park right there in front of Counselor's Row and come in there and always shooting his mouth off. I mean, John was very very loud and very vocal. So what we did was, and this is whether he was really stupid, and so were they to fall for this. This was their idea. What they were going to do was. They put $100,000 in the bank account, and they wanted me to go and tell Pat, you know, my client, and it's a, it's a friend of John Began's, it's one of his money guys, uh, wants to come in there. He has a partnership, uh, and he wants to come in there, get, take 100000 out of the bank because he's concerned the partner's going to be coming into town the next day, they, you know, to take the money out of the account. We wanted to get a judge in particular, Judge Scatillo, was the one that they wanted to target. And uh, Judge Scatillo was somebody who was over at counselors two, three times a week, meeting with Pat and meeting with the aldermen and discussing, always discussing all kinds of, you know, all kinds of business over there in the court system. What we wanted to do was have the judge stall the lawyer. You know, the lawyer would be coming in. The client would be coming in with a lawyer. Well, the lawyer was going to try to get, you know, go to court and try to get to get something to take the money out of the bank. What we wanted to do was have the judge stall him. So our client couldn't, so my client could come into town and take the money. And when this guy goes to lock up the money, uh, he won't be able to because the money will be gone. I come in to see Pat with this scenario, and I said, you know, can we get it done? He said, uh, you know, he said, sure. I'll make contact with him and just uh, let me know, and we agree on a $10,000 fee for that. Now, I'll tell you how stupid and how greedy Pat is. All a person has to do is wire the money out of there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? That's all he has to do. Why would he have to come into town to take the money out? He could have just wired the money out of the account, but for whatever reason, these guys all they saw was the you know, you know was the cash there, the ten thousand they were getting for doing it. What happened was they brought in an FBI agent. You know, I met with him on the day that we, he was supposed to go. The FBI agent and he indicated he was the attorney for for the one business partner. The judge was supposed to keep him there for a couple of hours. You know, so my client could come in and get the money because he wouldn't be able to get in until about 11 o'clock or so. So that's what the judge did. So the judge, uh, you know, stalls him in there. And supposedly my guy, you know, was able to take out the 100000 and he did. And so now we've got a case built on Pat Marcy. <clears throat> We're going to probably get ready to do something else. What happened was they had FBI agents after I paid Pat. They had FBI agents that were following him to see if he makes contact with the judge and gives him the money. And uh, and apparently, he didn't go anywhere and didn't do anything with it. It was going to be difficult making a case on the judge because we didn't show anybody getting him any money. So now what we did was I said, let's do it again. Well, what do you mean? I said, let's, <laughs> I said, let's, let's say that the guy moved the money to a different bank. Are you laughing because of their stupidity and how easy it was? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and you and you had extreme confidence that they would fall into the trap every time when there was cash being dangled. Well, I, you know, I didn't know for sure, but I suspected they would. You know, I suspected they would. So the second scenario now is I come back in there, the counselors, I said, Pat, the the client took the hundred thousand out and he moved it to a bank up on the north side. And now that you know we have to keep this guy locked up, you know, in the courtroom again and uh, and do it again. But this time the the attorney, no, I said the attorney went in into another judge's courtroom. He filed a motion to you know to go in there and to lock up the money in the bank account. And pretty much we want to do the same thing. This time it's going to be only five thousand dollars. We're getting a discount this time. What happens is now when I come into counselors and I tell Pat who the new judge is, it was judge, it was the head of Chancery. The case was up before the head of Chancery, who was a, a good friend of mine. What does Chancery mean? That's the most powerful court of all. And, you know, the, that's the court that has jurisdiction over every other case. That I've, was, never, I've never heard that word Chancery. Chancery law. Yeah. Look up, look up on your thing, can, Chancery. Can I... Can I, can I uh, 
intercede here for a moment to define chancery. The old English court in which the monarchy secretary or chancellor began hearing lawsuits during the 14th century. A court that can order acts performed. Today's chancery courts are merged with law courts in most states. How enlightening. Yeah, it's, it's the most powerful court of all. In other words, they have, you know, they have control over every other court. <clears throat> the head of chancery was a judge that was over there, you know, at councils all the time. Judge Comerford was the judge. Judge Comerford uh, was over at councils, I'd say, three, four days a week, you know, doing, doing all kinds of business for him. He was the chief judge in charge of all the other judges. He's the one that, you know, made all the judges, too. He's the one that played games with the, it's supposed to be all the judges voting. He was the one that had a list, you know, of who was supposed to be made a judge. And he would then get the list from Pat. Those are the ones that would, they, they would then contact 40 or 50 of the people that were under their control and they'd have them all vote for these particular people. But again, anyhow, when I came into counselor's row and Pat said, and, and in fact, the, the other judge, I was not going to wear a wire on him. I just didn't want to get involved with him because uh, he was a personal friend. And uh, I knew him. I knew his family. Uh, you know, they were good people. And, and I had never I had never bribed him myself before. He had always done everything for me. And I never gave him anything other than have him out for dinner and stuff like that. But I had never. Was had the never, word on the street that he was on the take or you just didn't know? I didn't know. And I don't know to this day if he was. Uh, so what happened is, as we're talking, Pat DeLeo is sitting there and he goes, oh, he's, I can take care of him. I hadn't thought about getting Pat until the moment he said that. And I'm wearing a wire when he comes up and says he can he can do that. We get Pat DeLeo involved in it now. Uh, <laughs> we get Pat DeLeo involved in, in this thing now, you know, with the judge. That was one of the cases where we indicted Pat DeLeo. And I think I told you or started to tell you before, they wanted to get Alderman Rody and they were going to they were going to buy a business there in the Chinatown area up in Bridgeport there, uh, you know, to make a case. But that's when my brother Bill told me he had seen the Alderman and the Alderman said, you know, is that your brother? And he said, have him come and see me. And that's when I'm sitting over there in counselors and Pat gets himself cut in on the deal. And also at the same time, I'm, when I'm wearing the wire, you know, makes a statement. Everybody knows what the rules are. Or everybody has to pay. Uh, talking about the builders, any any of the builders that are going to be building, they all know that they have to pay. We build a case there on both the Alderman and on Pat. Uh, that was the thing that we convicted Alderman Fred Rohde on. What happened was when we finally go to trial with Pat Marcy, when I come in there and what they did with me, I would be brought into the courtroom. I'd wait in the FBI office until it was you know, ready to go to court. I would go upstairs. They would put me in the chair in a witness box. Then the jury would be brought in afterwards after I'm already sitting in there because they'd have security all around there. And they didn't want them to see me coming in with all kinds of security. Because when I would come in there, they'd have like four. <laughs> they'd have like, hey, you're going to. In the federal building where nobody can get in anyhow, but they'd have like four of these marshals all around me. And then they'd go, they'd go sit there in the gallery. What happened was when I was sitting there, now I hadn't seen Ed Jensen, who I totally despised. And, uh, you know, and I told you about Eddie before. That was the one that, you know, when he threatened me with uh, Jimmy the Bomber, I bounced him up against the wall there, you know, by, uh, by my office. Pat Marcy's sitting out there at the, you know, at the one table. They had Fred Rohde there. They tried the two of them together, Pat Marcy and Fred Rohde. The two of them were sitting there at the table, and Eddie Jensen was there representing Pat Marcy. And uh, I'm not sure who was representing Alderman Rohde. But as I'm sitting in the in the box, and the jurors are being brought in, Eddie comes walking up to me. You know, he says, hey, Bob, how you doing? Gee, you look great. I said, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> He's going to come up and be nice to me. And Jensen, just as a reminder, was someone who you had years of history with as kind of co-counsel. And your main issue with him was that he would hand over information to the mob about people who were informants, knowing that these people would get killed. Even though he wasn't directly pulling the trigger, he was indirectly getting people killed. I knew two or three myself. You know, Butch, he had mentioned before, he was involved with the Ranella case with me when I left town and then came back and saw Marco, you know, Marco said, you know, clearly said, you know, the fat man did the right thing. And, you know, and you did, and you did what you did, but uh, I knew he was involved in, in all of that. 
Uh, and I just despised the person. I just absolutely despised him. But anyhow, now, while the jury is still being, being seated, you know, I look over the table and here's Pat giving me the evil eye, staring at me. Had you seen the evil eye from him ever before, not necessarily directed towards you, but anybody? He seemed like a guy that was fairly controlled and collected usually, right? Not someone prone to outbursts or a lot of emotions. You know, when he was angry, you know, people knew it. And like I say, I was the only one that I knew that I could joke around with him. But that was my nature. Everybody else was unbelievably serious. Nobody cracked jokes, you know, with him. It was strict. Everything was strictly business. Uh, but again, he had a very evil look about him. You know, he would stare right through you. I told you that one time when, when he made that payoff, when he said to me, nobody would dare cooperate against us. And I'm thinking, well, you may be looking at the person that would. I was actually concerned he could be reading my mind. I think I mentioned that to you before. You did. Uh, you, you know, as I said, he was giving me the evil eye, you know, obviously trying to scare me. I winked and smiled. I smiled and I winked at him. As soon as I did that, he started coughing and wheezing. You know, <laughs> you know, they wind up, you know, stopping the system. By now, the jury is sitting there. Everybody's looking at him, and they go and they get him some water. They bring him some water. And this went on for about four or five minutes where he's coughing and coughing and coughing. And then finally, it, it seems like he's a, a little bit better. And we just get started, and then he starts it again. They wind up stopping the trial. They wheel him out of the courtroom, and I'm furious. I'm thinking he's faking. No one will ever know. Maybe his anger was so repressed that when you smiled and winked at him, that just sent him over the edge. This is my thought as he's looking at me. Here's a man that was able to do anything, be able to fix anybody else's cases. He was able to do anything. The most powerful by far, you know, mob, you know, mob boss, probably of all time. And yet he's the one I'm sure who put the million dollars on my head. I'm certain he's the one that, you know, did it. Yet here he sees me and now he's a dead man in terms of he's, he knows he's going to be convicted. Uh, that's what I'm sure caused all that in his own mind. You know, the hatred he had, you know, seeing me up there like that. And then when I winked and smiled instead of panicking, you know, I'm sure that's what put him over. But I'm, I'm going to take credit for that, <laughs> right? Rightfully or not, I'm going to take credit for it. Everybody is saying, you know, and I used to joke, well, he beat the case. He never got convicted. But what did happen, though, in terms of he's fortunate, I mean, not him, but his, his kid in the family, if he had been convicted, they would have gone after all the funds that he had gotten since he wasn't convicted. You know, the family got to keep all the money. And this guy had to have millions stashed away. You know, I'm sure he had cash overseas uh, because, I mean, every day, every day money was coming in. And what they had, too, was, you know, they had the insurance agency that had all the insurance for all the buildings there in the downtown area. And, you know, we didn't talk before. And at the same time, when we're talking about Pat, what they had was they had a couple of schemes, too, to make a ton of money. They had a, a circus. Uh, they had a circus that they put on. It would be it would be a three-day weekend. They rent that place over there. The Shriners had a big, you know, a big place there that they would rent out and have the circus there. They would sell these tickets. It was a dollar a piece, but they'd wind up selling millions of them. I mean, millions of them. What they would do, every bookmaker, every mob guy in all the different families would get thousands of these. Uh, what they would do is they would tell these people, you're going to buy 200 or 300 or 500 of them. And, uh, and when you buy them, you're going to donate them right back to us. This place only held about 20,000 people. So there's going to be, and this is all cash coming in for this, but they made millions of dollars. This was a circus? Right. Wrangling Brothers and whatever yeah. circus. That, that they, was that at the old Chicago Amphitheater? Across from the stockyard? No, 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 no. It was uh, on Deer. I think on Dearborn Street. The Shriners had a place there, and it only held about I think twenty thousand people. And they had like two shows a day, 
And it was supposed to be a circus for, you know, these poor black kids and whatever. The people would be told to buy, you know, you're buying 500, you're buying 500 tickets and every bookmaker had to buy them. Every mob guy, you know, was assigned a couple thousand apiece. Every business had to buy them. But after you buy them, you donate them right back, supposedly to be given to the kids from Cabrini and whatever. But they made millions once a year, you know, with that. Because there was a finite number of tickets you could sell based on how many seats are in the venue and how many times there was an event. So what they were doing was, and I'm laughing because it's Can't, so stupid. Every, they would muscle people to donate for a worthy cause. And the muscle was, you got to buy these, but not only do you have to buy these, you got to give them back to us. So when they got them back, they'd recycle them to another group of people. So so essentially, if you were to account for how many tickets were sold, it'd be like hundreds of thousands, yet the capacity would be like maxed at what, like 40,000 total for like two shows or something or not two shows, but maybe 10 shows over a few days. It was three days and there'd be two shows a day, you know, one in the, uh, in like the afternoon and one in the evening. And so they would hold like that, that would be 20, 40, and I'm, I'm guessing 20, maybe not even that many, but at the very tops, 20,000. And so it'd be, uh, it'd be 40, three, four, it'd be 120,000, you know, seats available. Some of the businesses, you know, every business would be approached and some of the businesses would probably give checks because they can deduct that. But with all the criminal element, all the bookmakers and and all the mob collectors. What they were doing was, you know, guys like Butchie or Harry or Marco, you know, Marco had probably in the Elmwood Park crew, about four or 500 people at minimum in their crew, you know, with all the crews, because, and I knew that because once a year when they would pass out the money to these people, in fact, I wired up and went to one of them at Christmas time. uh, That's when they would pass out the money for the whole year for the bonuses for all these people. There'd be three, 400 people there playing dice and whatever. So every single one of those people were told, you know, if you have like, you know, 15, 20 bookmakers, every one of them is forced to buy anywhere from, you know, two to 500 of these tickets. You know, they hand them to them and they just hand and they pay them. And then they say, no, you want we want you to donate those back. And there's no, absolutely no way to trace any of that. None whatsoever. And they do that once a year. And that's one event. Another thing that they had over with uh, Angelo LaPietra with the hook, <clears throat> there was a restaurant over there, the Hungry Hound. That was Larry Pusateri's place, but uh, Angelo LaPietra, the hook, was also a part owner of it. And right across the street from there, they had the all night nightclub. But behind there, there was a huge, a huge parking area. I mean, huge. Probably almost like a quarter of a block. And what they would have once a year there is a rib fest. And they'd have truckloads of the ribs and they'd have the chicken and they'd have the pork and all kinds of and all kinds of other stuff. They would sell those tickets the same way. I'm pretty sure it was like five or ten dollars, you know, ten dollars a piece. And everybody is being forced, all these guys are being forced to sell a couple hundred tickets a piece again. The place only held maybe about uh, three or four hundred people. Uh, you know, that they'd be coming and going. There'd be a mob there, but they'd be selling hundreds of thousands of these tickets to people that's doing the same thing with all the, you know, all the mob guys, you know, all have to sell so many and from all the different groups, not just from his. And, you know, but, you know, it was a great barbecue. I would go every year because, I mean, fabulous ribs and fabulous other stuff. But again, they would make who knows how much money with that because now we're talking $10 a ticket and everybody's forced to buy, you know, to buy 20 or 30 or 50, depending on how and on how many bookmakers they had under them. Were they the sponsors of the rib event or they just had access to tickets? Uh, it was done there. Larry Pusateri was the one who, who had the big dice game there, too. That's something we we haven't talked about. Uh, you know, the gambling operations there, unbelievable, unbelievable. You know, there, it was like regular casinos in there. They had one at 26th Street. That was Angelo's. Larry Pusateri was, you know, he was a bookmaker I was betting with, uh, but he was also a client of mine because he got arrested a couple of times and I represented him. In fact, he's the one I wrote about in the book that was involved where they raped Susie up there by uh, in the Rush Street area. Wait, what, 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 who's they? Who raped Susie? 
And who's Susie? There were, what happened, gee, we keep going from topic to topic. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't, why don't we finish off Marcy and then come back to the gambling in, in Pusateri? Because we were right on that trajectory. You wink at him. He goes into this coughing fit. Is that the end of the trial? And he has a heart attack and passes? Does he come back to court after that moment? Never came back. No. But as I said, he started coughing and wheezing right away. And they brought him some water. And it seemed like he was getting better. And uh, and we just had started with the jury. I'm the first witness. I had just started to testify. You know, you know, what is your name? You know, Tommy Durkin was the one who put me on. He was uh, he was the one that was prosecuting the case. And with that, Pat started wheezing again. He started coughing and wheezing and his head now was down on the table. My first thought is this son of a bitch is faking it. This son of a gun is faking it. They wind up carting him out of there and they, they get a stretcher and they wind up carting him out of the courtroom. And I'm telling Tom. This son of a gun is faking it. He's, no, he's ne- never had a health problem. He's always been unbelievably healthy. He's faking it. And they took him over to the hospital and they put a pause on the trial. They said, you know, the trial is being postponed while he gets, while he gets checked over. He had had a heart attack is what it was. He had a heart attack and he was in the hospital, you know, for, for a couple of days. And what they did was they severed him now from the trial. And we proceeded with the trial with Alderman Rody, who was still there. The two of them were initially tried together. And what we did was we put the whole trial on, including all the stuff with him or whatever. And poor Rody is sitting there and, you know, and, and caught up and all that. But uh, we wound up, so his case was severed. He was severed from there. We wound up convicting, you know, Fred Rohde. This was not a bench trial. This was a jury trial. Who was the judge? Oh, no, sure it was a jury. Sure it was a jury trial. Who was the judge? Do you recall? No, I don't. I don't remember. You probably have it there because it was it was a well publicized. You know, Pat, Pat Marcy and Fred Rohde. If you look on your thing, it'll probably tell you who the uh, who the judge was. So Marcy passes. How how soon does he pass? He has a heart attack. They wound up taking him over to Mayo Clinic. I guess within a couple of days, he went to Mayo Clinic and never survived. Uh, you know, I'd be guessing with the amount of days because he just never, we never saw him again. He was gone. Never came back into the courtroom and uh, could have been a couple of days, could have been a couple of weeks. I don't know. And I was told that he died. Yes. Interesting. Do we know that he died that way? <laughs> Were there ever rumors that it was all a bait and switch and Obviously, the guy was pushing 80. No, but no, but he, 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 he couldn't have faked it. He couldn't have faked dying. He died. <laughs> he had the heart attack because I thought he was faking, but it was, he was diagnosed because they said that was why they severed him from the case. Yeah, but who's, when, who, uh, who says he had a heart attack? He was taken over to, to the hospital. Was he? He was, take, he was, taken, he was taken to the hospital. Came, when we came back the next day to the court, they said, you know, he had a heart attack. Well, here's what and I'm so here. here I, he'll, be, I, he'll be suffered from the case. I don't want to create any conspiracy theories, but if there was anybody ever who could fix his fake heart attack and rig it, wouldn't this be the guy? No, I mean, I, I, I never saw him again, but I mean, he was taken over there to the hospital and, uh, you know, and, and they indicated he had a heart attack. And then what they did was I, this, I was just told this. I was told he went to the Mayo Clinic. You know, they went, they sent him to the Mayo Clinic, and uh, and he died. I bet on the way to the Mayo Clinic, he did a left turn and headed west. No, the moment the moment I surfaced, the moment I surfaced, he lost. I'm sure he lost all his power. The moment I surfaced, and people realized that you know that you know that uh, he's going to be indicted and whatever. You know, in fact, what what Richie Daly did. As soon as I surfaced, Richie Daly broke up the first ward. He took away all their power. He took away all the buildings and, and whatever. And I guarantee you, nobody, nobody but nobody would be talking to Pat Marcy. He couldn't do anything anymore. He's toxic. You know, once he, well, you know, once once word got out what was going to happen, and that was why they put a million dollars on my head if they could have gotten me. But one of the things that I did, you know, as I told you before, I I never expected to survive all this. I just didn't. I figured at some point, you know, they'd get suspicious of me. 
or something would happen, especially now when, when Pat put his hand on the thing that one time and in a couple of other situations, uh, a couple of other where they should have gotten suspicious. What I had to do was I had to make sure with my tapes, there was enough there on the tapes. So if I, if I was dead, they could still convict these people. And that was why, you know, and I was, I, I knew exactly what to say and how to say it and how to build the case, even with me not surviving, because we'd have, we'd have them on tape admitting to certain things and doing certain things. Because another thing, we there was one occasion, another occasion when when I was supposed to see Alderman Rody, I was supposed to make a payoff to Fred Rody, and I went over to his office. And when I get to his office, they said, "Oh, he's in the city council. He's down in the city council." And uh, okay, so I'll go over to see him in the city council. So now I'm wearing a wire. As I turn the corner in City Hall, there's a long, a long hallway there. I don't know if you've ever been to City Council there. In, in I've, been, I've, I've been to City Hall. I actually had a meeting years ago with Richard Daly. God, it had to be the early 2000s. It's an awesome building to go into, but what was the coolest thing, and I apologize for digressing, is that you may know this, in Richie Daly's office, he's got a desk. It's a huge, beautiful, mahogany desk, and the desk belonged to his father. And he tells you a story about the history of this desk, his father and JFK sitting around this desk during the Democratic Convention in Illinois. I don't remember what the year was, but there's there's this aura about his office and his desk. But I have been to City Hall and it's an awesome building, but I haven't been down to where um, the chambers for, for the aldermen are. Well, what, what happens if you come in from the LaSalle Street side and you walk in there, you know, half, you know, it's about halfway, you know, right in the middle of the block. If you walk in there and you go in a short ways, you turn to the left, there's this long hallway and then you've got the chambers. And as I, and it's a long walk up there. As I, as I turn the corner to go up there, they've got metal detectors sitting there. There had been a march that day and, you know, where, you know, where the black group was, was protesting something. You know, they were worried about bombs or who knows what. I had never seen it before, but they blocked they blocked the area off maybe about 10, 15 feet from the doorway. And uh, as I'm starting to walk down there, there's a metal detector, and they're stopping everybody. Nobody's able to get through. The tables are blocking the area, and you have to walk to the metal detector. And Fred Rohde is standing there. He's standing. He came out of the city council, and as I'm walking, he's motioning for me. You know, he's motioning for me to come, you know, to come there. I can't walk through that, you know, and I'm, I'm walking, but I can't go through that because I've got a, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a wire on. As I get about maybe 10 feet, I just turn around and walk away. You know, I turn around and I just, and I just walk back out and I walk out of city hall and I walk out of city hall. And what I do is I go back over, my car was parked there in front of city, in front of, you know, in front of the 100 North building. What I do is I take the wire off. I take off the wire and, uh, and I wait a while and I go into, I go over into counselors and Pat Marcy was there. And I said, yeah, I was supposed to go see Freddie. I said, but uh, they got a, a metal detector there. I said, I couldn't go through that. I said, because I got a gun. I said, you know, because I always have my, because I've got my gun, I have my gun on. <laughs> when Rody, when Rody comes out, uh, when he comes out of there, you know, he, in fact, he called over there. He called, uh, you know, at the, uh, he called their counselors. He called them the tell on the phone there and Pat answers the phone and he says, yeah, he's here. He's here. And, uh, and, uh, and then Freddie comes over, and I'm not wearing the wire. You know, I've got the I got the wire in my car. I took it off, and he says, "What the hell was going on?" You know, and I said, not Fred." I said, "You know, you know." And I show him. I said, "You know, I got my piece. I can't." Says I can't. Well, oh, okay, okay. Well, you got the money. <laughs> Perfect. But, uh, Perfect excuse, right? Well, that, you know, I had to say something, but that's exactly what I said. You know, you know, I had to, I had to ju justify because you know the look he gave me as I suddenly turn, start to turn around. I stop and start to turn around. He, he gives me this look. This look. What the hell? There were a number of other things that happened where I didn't know for sure if these people were suspicious of me. What I had been doing, you know, I had been going to the racetrack where Fiorola was with uh, with Oli, with you know the major bookmaker. So I was going over there, and I was bringing FBI agents in there. 
you know, make them like they were friends of mine. I brought three or four agents over there and had them sit with me, you know, at the table and, you know, had them, you know, because they were going to, they were looking to work cases on them where they were all the racetracks. They had, they had their own guys that were booking and, and I would suspect they were booking more money than was actually going through the windows of the racetrack. Unbelievably you know, nervous, but again, nothing I could do about it. And as I said, my sole purpose in life was to make sure that, you know, I destroyed the first ward. You know, that was what controlled not just the entire city, but that's what that was the power structure for these mobsters so they could kill people and do whatever. No one could get away with it. You had mentioned they put a million dollar hit on your head. How do you know this? Who told you? Um, what do you call Jimmy Wagner. They got word out there. It was a million dollars on my head. Not surprising. Oh, not not surprising at all. And as I said, I'm sure it had to be Pat. Well, I told you before that Arcardo called the Blackie Pasoli, said to him, if this guy's been cooperating for a period of time, he can destroy all we've built over the years. And he was absolutely right. So Marcy passes and Rhodey goes down. Is that the end of it? You know, we convicted not just, you know, not just them, but, uh, you know, among other things, what, uh, we convicted some judges. We convicted, you know, Judge Stillo. Uh, we convicted his nephew, Joey. And that was what I told you about that. That was where we, we never gave him any money, never talked about any money, found the guy guilty, and we still convicted him. Yeah. We convicted him of, of bribery and, jo- and Joey, too. Uh, Joey did a short time in jail, but when he came out, he committed suicide, uh, you know, because his, his world was over. He, he loved being around the bad guys, Joey. He liked hanging with the, with the mobsters and the rest of it. Let's, let's get back. You know, we were talking about the gambling operations. Yes, you were talking about, you were talking about this character. Louis Passarello. Passarello. And Louis Passarello. And who was Louis uh, Passarello? And he's the one who owned the Hungry Hound. And he was a captain under uh, the hook, under under La Petra. In fact, he had said to me one time, I run the biggest dice game here in the city, and I want you to come to see it. It was really sharp how they had set the place up. It was over on 26th Street in the middle of the block. What would happen is you'd walk into this, into this looks like a store, and over on the left hand side there was an area way where you would walk. You would walk out there. You didn't, in, and you have no idea where you're going. It's just an area way that's all enclosed, probably a few thousand feet, and you wind up in some other location. And you know, there's no way of telling what it is the way it's set up. What do you, what do you mean? So there's like a storefront. You go through a door or a hallway, and then it leads to another building, but you're not quite sure where you are. You don't know where you are. There's no address, nothing to it. It was the way they had built it. It was a huge building, you know, area way, a building. When you say built it, you mean the building was constructed that way, and these mobsters took it over and utilized it for their gambling endeavors. They had, no, what they had done. And the same thing over on Halstead, what they did there too. That was that was for a different, that was for a, some kind of a Greek game where they would have close to 60, 70 people at a time up there, and a lot of times even more. What they had done was, I'm sure there was a regular, there were stores up and down, up and down the street on 26th Street. You walk into this, looks like a, you know, like a relatively small office area or storefront, you know, and, and in there, There'd just be a desk and some other stuff. And on the left-hand side, there's an area way, a door. There'd be a door there. And once you open that up and you walk out, there's like walls all around you. And they've got a, a roof of some sort above it. And it's an area where it's only about maybe, you know, six, seven feet wide. And you walk through there and then you walk over to your right. And then you walk over to your left again. And you go into this huge building inside there. It's a huge area where where, where they've got a couple of dice tables in there. Uh, they've got some blackjack tables set up. And the place holds probably easily 100, 100 plus people. And that's where they would have the dice game a couple of times a week. A couple of days a week, they'd have the dice game, uh, you know, just like a regular casino. And you've got people playing blackjack over in the sides, uh, you know, and the tables would be loaded with people. They'd have food there, too. They'd have in the one corner, they'd have all kinds of sandwiches and all kinds of other food. They did the same thing over on Halstead Street, right about a block down from Redditi's, south of Redditi's. You walk into the store. In the back of it, there's steps. If you're looking at it from, from outside, 
and it looks like it's just like a wall with nothing behind it. You have to go, to go in there. You have to walk in through this building, and then you go to the right. And you go up these stairs, and then there's almost like a, a little bridge of sorts, and you wind up going to the next street. And there you're in some building. There's no address in the building. That's where, you know, what, what they would have up there. They'd have lambs and they'd have pigs, you know, that they would roast. And they throw them in like cardboard in these huge cardboard boxes. And they had they had paper plates all around there. And uh, but what a lot of these people would do is, you know, while they're playing, the game would start somewhere about nine o'clock and go until about four or five in the morning. They also had another real big card game in uh, in Cicero, Louis Panos, who who had that game. And that was the one that when they would get raided once in a while, again Pat Marcy would, uh, you know, Pat would just bring me the paperwork on it. And I wouldn't charge him anything, but what I would get when they'd arrest him, they'd, they'd get like 50, 60 people at a time. And what I would take was I would take all their $100 bonds, which are worth $90. I'd have all these people sign those things over to me. So I'd pick it up around 4500 You would never kick that money back to Marcy. He just didn't know or didn't give a shit. No, no, exactly. He didn't give a shit. One thing happened really interesting one time with Pat. The one time when, you know, when I really got and and straightened him out, he gave me one of those cases. And this one, it came from the FBI. The FBI was behind getting this place raided. And I knew this, this came from the FBI because they basically never raided these places because you had Hanhart, who was the chief of detectives during that period, and he wouldn't let him. He wouldn't let him go outside the city. And this was in Cicero. So the game was totally protected because they were paying off the uh, the sheriff's police out there. There was a uh, Dvorak and company. Uh, those guys were all, uh, they were all on the payroll. Off the tables, they had taken about $30,000 in cash. And it was Louis Panos's game. What happened was when I took him into court and I had been told that it was the FBI that was behind it, when, when the case was up before Judge Sedini. And uh, so when I went in there, uh, you know, I got the case dismissed, but uh, he, in fact, the judge says, you know, what about these funds? Meaning, you know, who's going to, uh, who's going to sign for them or do you want them? It was like almost 30,000 in cash. And I said, no, I just wasn't, I wouldn't take that. And I told Louie, you know, you know, you don't want to take that because, you know, you have to sign for it. The feds are behind this and they're looking to see who's going to be running this thing. I said, so I'm not going to ask the judge for the money. I said, no, you know, that's 30,000. I said, well, I'm just not going to do it. A couple of days later, I'm in counselor's row and Pat comes in and uh, he says, let me talk to you for a minute. Could we walk out into the hall? And he says, did you take that money? I said, what, what money? What are you talking about? He says, that the 30000 Did you take it for yourself? I said, Pat, whoa, ho, ho, ho. Pat, you think I would do something like that? Pat, I didn't take it. I didn't let the judge give it to me or anybody else because, you know, it's a federal matter. The feds are involved in this, and it could be a problem. But I said, you know, I wanted to make sure he didn't think for one minute. You know, these people are unbelievable about money. But it was the first time he ever had questioned me like that. Did you yeah. take the money? And I says, oh, 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 no, you know, oh, no, Pat. The gambling operations were all over the city, but mainly out in the suburbs, too. Every group had sometimes two or three card rooms. The, the revenue from the gambling was astronomical. We're talking millions and millions of dollars on a constant basis. Uh, they they put a street tax on every single criminal activity. The ones that were out stealing the cars, they had to pay so much a car. They had to turn it over to the mob-connected shop shops, and these guys had to pay. Then you've got the shops where they moved the stolen parts. These guys got to pay a street tax. With, with burglars, the burglars, the major burglars had to pay a street tax to whoever, you know, whoever had them. Uh, what are they called? Horizontal integration? It became like a business. I told you before, the clerks in the courthouse and certain guys they would call, check and make sure this guy isn't paying. You walk into like a uh, narcotics court over there at uh, 26 in California. You got the court sergeant, who I know is, is doing that. You know, they're all looking at the files coming in. They're taking the names down from the people that have been arrested. Some of the cops that are making the arrests. Would uh, would contact their you know their contact is this guy on is this guy on the list? I was there at, at Elmwood Park, as I said when they first started doing this, and 
I would see them come in there. They're different mob bosses. Every day, they come in there. And Marco had a little private room in the one, you know, in the one section of the uh, of the clubhouse, and uh, they come in there and they'd be in there for you know for forty five minutes an hour. And what they were doing, we've got this guy, we've got that guy, we've got this guy now. Put him on your list. So you know not to bother them. Sure, that's why Jimmy the Bomber was killed, and so were some of these others. Uh, when Giancana came back, and now the rules had changed. When he was gone to Mexico, it's you know everybody belongs to somebody. He did, he didn't take no for an answer, and his guys were out you know grabbing somebody who was you know who was doing something, and he says I'm with so and so, and they say I don't care, you're going to pay us, and th- that's why they were that's why they were killing each other. That wraps up conversation 16, 17's forthcoming. We're close to the end. Thanks again for listening. Follow Neil on Twitter.